I was talking recently with a friend of mine about something that uh, he was experiencing as a very serious problem, which was the inability to meditate very well and the consequent sort of sense of not measuring up on a most fundamental practice, especially on this particular path of self-realization, um, which is based around Kriya Yoga and um, silent communion with God. And the logical, rational mind naturally thinks that what I need to do in order to overcome this problem is I need to try harder, I need to work more, I need to be more tough, I need to be more disciplined, sort of all of the things that we imagine. And the conversation, it was interesting to me because in the course of talking to my friend, I was realizing things myself that have taken me most of my life to really understand. We think our problems are solved by willpower. We think that the things that are wrong with us are, are our fault and we have to do something about them. And the paradox is that's true. Um, no one ever gets into heaven or Harvard without putting out a lot of effort, you know, in one way or another. You can't just wish your way there. And you can't just declare that you're already there when you're not. There has to be focused attention. But actual transformation takes place when we have surrendered um, that strong sense of self without which we mostly imagine we wouldn't even exist. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita it says, what is day to the worldly man is night to the yogi. And what is night to the worldly man is day to the yogi. And what they mean by worldly is those whose attention and self-definition is focused through the senses on the material world and whose sense of satisfaction, happiness, and self-worth comes from that point of view. And the yogi is the one who has understood that my inner consciousness is my real consciousness and everything else manifests from that. Not too long ago, I was talking to a young man, very dynamic young man, very serious on the spiritual path. And he was trying to, is trying to sort out exactly where he belongs. And when he finds out where he belongs, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do when he's there. And one of the things he mentioned was that he has a natural desire to be prosperous. And he spoke of those of us who have given our life to Ananda as being overworked and underpaid. I said, oh, is that how it looks to you? You know? Um, it's true that there is an absolute identity for many of us in everything that we do. But that doesn't feel like overwork. That just feels like unified living. But when I was reflecting, and I don't mean to criticize him, he was in a perfect, it was perfectly reasonable what he was saying. But I realized that from a very young age, I never actually wanted anything except to be happy. And it felt to me like, unless we organized that fundamental principle of being happy, none of the other things we tried were going to really work out to be anything that we actually wanted. Now, of course, this young man's idea that he doesn't want to be overworked and underpaid but desires to be prosperous, is based obviously on the idea that he thinks he'll be happy if he's prosperous. And he'll be consequently unhappy if he's overworked and underpaid. I mean, so the natural premise, but the premise, you see, is that these things will give me happiness. Now, that's how everybody thinks. That's what the Bhagavad Gita says. If we look at the external world, you think I need certain external conditions to be happy. But if you live as a yogi, you realize that once I find happiness within me, I can do anything. And not only can I do anything and be happy doing it, but then I also have the power to magnetize to myself everything that I need. 
in our schools. Swami Kriyananda recently wrote an introduction to the book about education. And he said, what we really need to teach children is how to have money magnetism. To have the capacity to generate the energy they need to do whatever they need to do in life. And that starts from the inner reality of being happy. That's where it begins. A friend commented to a woman who grew up in our Ananda system and went to our schools and whose parents were lifelong devotees. She said, most people I know take advantage of opportunity, but you have the capacity to create your own opportunity. And that's the magnetism we're talking about of being inwardly in tune. Now back to my friend who was struggling with meditation. The great secret of life that the masters come to teach us is so simple that we keep looking everywhere but just believing it exactly as it is. And that is that the kingdom of God is within. And seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Well, my friend says, but I can't meditate very well. How can I seek the kingdom of God? Well, you know, we can't help what we are now. It seemed like a good idea, whatever karmic causes we put in to get us to this point. Everything we do seems like a good idea at the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And we find ourselves, the fruit of all of our incarnations is this, you know? Nothing particularly to be proud of or to write home about, but there it is. There's a great um, remark of Jesus in the Bible just before he was crucified. Um, Save me from this hour, Lord, he says, but for this hour was I born. And you think, oh, in the magnificent life of Jesus, whose tiny babyhood we're celebrating tonight, you know, of course for this hour he was born, he was going to be crucified and overcome death and be resurrected. And well, here we are celebrating him still all these years later. One of my friends gave a Sunday sermon on that reading, and he said, think about it. For this hour were you born too. All of your efforts in all of your incarnations have brought you precisely to this moment. And in a strange way, and I will correct this as I go on, but there's nothing you can do about it. What you're able to do or not able to do, what you can accomplish, what you can't accomplish, your successes, your failures, your happinesses, your sadness, that's, it's all in the past. By the time you can look at it, by very definition, it's already over. So the only thing you actually have is the flow of your energy. Where is your energy going? And the more we think, I will accomplish by my will, the more we take our little smallness and compress it and compress it and compress it, and then we get to compress it into self-flagellation and to anger with ourselves and disappointment, and all of that makes us feel like we're really doing something, you know? But the only thing that God wants from us is a joyous, open-hearted acceptance of His love. Just that's all. There's a song that we're not singing tonight, but it's a celebration of the birth of Jesus. Sing out with joy. All you who labor, all you who sorrow, know that the Savior awaits but your love. Not your hard work, not your guilt, not your new resolution, not your four hours of meditation a day, awaits but your love. And no matter what, we can always give that. You see, that's what's so remarkable. Because our hearts are directed toward that which we treasure. Do we treasure our self-image as powerful and important and capable? Or do we just treasure our littleness in the face of this overwhelming gift of unconditional love from the infinite Lord? Tonight we're celebrating Jesus. Tonight everything is about the life of Christ. But Jesus was the Christ. And the love that he offered us was not the love of Jesus the man, 
But the fact that there was no man there to inhibit or limit God's perfect love. He said to his disciples, you, have, you, you know the Father. You have seen the Father. And then the disciples said, when have we seen the Father? The Father meant the infinite Lord. When have we seen the Father? Jesus said, you have seen me. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And he didn't mean, again, Jesus, the little man who was born and, in fact, did die on the cross, although Jesus, the Christ Spirit. He's a perfect window. And he's a perfect window through which we can both receive and offer. Awaits but your love. All you who sorrow know that the Savior awaits but your love. What do we love? Do we love our egos? Do we love our possessions? Do we love our position in the world? Or do we love God's presence within? Yes, of course, when we can meditate deeply, it's meaningful because it connects us to that presence within. But the fruit of that connection is the giving and the receiving of the love. One of my friends also, living in community for 40 years, you have a lot of friends. One of my friends was in a very bad mood for a very long time. And those of us who had to live close to her were suffering a great deal because of her mood. And I, being a very good friend, was appointed to try to understand what was going on with her and see if we could help. She declared to me, I'm having a terrible time meditating, and it's just so upsetting to me, the same story as it happens. And I looked at her like this, and I said, oh, and, and therefore, I'm crabby, and I'm unpleasant, and I'm uncooperative because I'm so upset about this. And you see, in her own mind, that looked like a good idea. I need to show how important this is to me by being in a constantly upset emotional state over it. I said, you know, when I'm in a period of time when I can't meditate very well, I think it's very important for me to be very joyous and happy all the time because I have to make up for it somewhere, <laughs> right? But you see, that's actually very wise. So if it's not working in one way, you just go to find it to work in another way. Because all, we're, all that God wants from us is our love. If we can't love God in perfect, silent communion, then love God in service. If we can't love God um, in solitude, then love God in other people. Know that the Savior awaits but your love. And the oddest thing happens when we just decide... Oh, look at me, worthless and crummy though I am. God loves me just the same. And worthless and crummy though I am, Lord, there's nothing you can do because I love you and you are stuck with me. You know? God really likes it when you talk to him like that. I've joked sometimes that I sort of feel like if I can't hold Master's hand, I'm going to hang on to his ankle. You know? It's just like, no matter what, I won't let go. Because what really changes us is when we don't let go. And so Jesus descends into this world, and he comes into this world, you have to understand. He doesn't come for the perfect people. He comes for us. One of Master's disciples, Oliver Black, was a very advanced disciple, and he was running a meditation center in Detroit. And he said to Master Yogananda, his guru, he said, Sir, all the, the only people who seem to come are the halt, the blind, and the lame. And then Master looked at Oliver Black and he said, Oliver, they're your people. <laughs> Just like that. All those who labor, all those who sorrow, know that the Savior awaits but your love. If this world is working perfectly for people, they don't look beyond it. You know? Those of us who think about God in our lives, who come to welcome Christ, we welcome Christ in our life because we need him. And I don't mean that in the fundamentalist way. I mean that we need the bliss of Christ consciousness that we can find more easily by tuning in to the perfect manifestations of it in this world. 
You know, otherwise it just becomes vague for us. We sort of have this idea of what we're trying to do, but we don't know what it's really like. So we put the pictures of the masters on the altar with that beautiful picture of Jesus in the middle. And we look right into those eyes, and those eyes become for us the window onto infinity. And everything else swirls around it. I'm upset about this, I desire that, I'm disappointed about this, I long for this, I'm resentful about that, I'm all of these different things. But all we look is through that window of infinity. We just look through that window of infinity, and then the waves come and go, and what we are responsible for, we still have to put our best energy into it. We do the best we can, but it's entirely different when we do it in the company of the divine. And these masters, Jesus descending tonight, they come to us to manifest it, to remind us, and to awaken the love of our hearts. The Christmas story is the sweetest, most heart-centered time of year. That's why everyone is so happy. We're doing extremely, we're working extremely hard in our society to absolutely kill the essence of what Christmas is about. And I don't just mean materialism, but I mean by just taking everything about God out of it. But it's all about God. You know, buying gifts, if you can afford to buy them, is that's fine. But do it with God. Do it for God. You know, the, the presents that you wrap up, let them be presents to the divine around you. Let the divine be running through you. Everything that you do, look into the eyes of the Master. Look through the Master into infinity. And if you do, if you have talents and you do things well, and if you're a great devotee and you never miss your meditation, hooray! And if you're the halt, the blind, and the lame, Jesus came for us just as well. He came for those who love him. You know, and sometimes the one who behaves the worst loves the most because they're more desperate. You know? There's a little story about Piglet and Pooh. Piglet and Pooh get lost. And Pooh, who's kind of weak all the time. Piglet, I mean, who's kind of weak. Piglet can only think of one thing to do. First, Piglet falls on the ground in despair. And then Piglet manages to lift his little head. And he says, help! And then he puts his head down again. <laughs> like that. I think the prayer of Piglet is a very good prayer. <laughs> Don't bother to be worried. Don't bother to beat yourself up. Don't bother to tell yourself you ought to be different. Goodness knows if you were capable of being different, you would be different. I figured that out once. It became my mantra. If I could have done better, I would have done better. And if I didn't do better, okay, Lord, we'll just stick together and at least I'll give you my love. And then Jesus comes. Literally, Jesus is born. He's literally born, the Christ consciousness born within you. <sighs> what a promise. You know? Why do we ever worry about anything? All know that the Savior awaits but your love.